getting our data out of our detectors, in analyzing our data, in making our pipelines both multi-stage and reproducible and fully tested. And the wonderful part is we can glue this all together with Python, which we love because it allows us to do so many parts of this. But Python is also an important part in the last stage of our analysis. And this is one that often gets a little bit less time than some of the others. But the human mind and eyes are a perceptual tool and how we choose to present our data, how we choose to present our science so that the rest of us, of our audience can understand it, is as key as any of these previous steps. I'm going to take you through pretty much three little parts of this that I think um, that I can cover in about 15 minutes, because there's a huge amount of work that's been done in this area and a huge amount of further reading you can do. And I, I want to encourage people to go and explore in these areas if they see something that they find interesting. First one I'm going to look at is colour palettes. When you have your data, what kind of data do you have? And how does assigning colour to that data allow you to perceive more things about what's going on in it, its systematics, and the kind of science that it's showing you? Then I want to spend a little time on chart junk, which is a term coined um, by Tuft of just the excess stuff that turns up on your plots that gets in between you and understanding what the plot is trying to show you. And I'll talk you through along the way of some packages that can make life a little easier in Python for uh, working with this. So color palettes. The first thing you have when you think about your data is assigning color to it allows you to add an extra dimension to your data. You don't want to obscure your data by assigning it color. You want to be able to actually give people as much of the data as possible. So you first have to think about what sort of data do you have? Do you have a data that's um, best represented by its continuously varying? Maybe uh, something like temperature? Then you probably have data that's um, of the sequential type. If you have data that has an intrinsic transition somewhere within its values, so that you have uh, um, a kind of level within it that you need to pull out that's important, maybe an inflection point of, uh, um, of transition in the regime, then you probably have something you'd better uh, map with a diverging color. And maybe the last sort is when you have data where you need to plot multiple things, but they're unrelated to each other by any um, given function. And then you have a qualitative sort of data. And so the sequential one, you generally have a single hue and you vary it in intensity. Now, I'm going to throw around a couple of words here about colour. Colour, in terms of colour theory, is a bit of a pain for astronomers because there are all these words, they have kind of regular meanings, then they have specialist meanings to us, and then there's colour theory, which kind of overloads these terms again. So if I use a word and it sounds out of context from the, um, from the situation you're normally used to hearing it in, that's probably because colour theory has overloaded it a bit, and I'm happy to go back through them. Hue, in this case, is kind of the name you assign to a colour. So blue is a clearly different hue from red. I like to think of it a bit as, as passband. Um, Intensity, on the other hand, is more how, how much white you're assigning into a colour. So you would say pink is a less intense version of red. So then there's also brightness. Uh, <laughs> it gets a little tricky. The trick is perception is kind of a three-axis set of these. And if you want to look more at um, how colour can be assigned to different sorts of data and what choosing a sequential, a diverging, a qualitative palette can mean. Cynthia Brewer put together a very good resource um, called Colour Brewer, from her surname. And that allows you to try assigning <coughs> these kinds of palettes and see how they mean. And it also has a very useful um, assigning to grayscale, so you can see if you print it in black and white how your colour palette is affected. And also it has uh, um, a very useful thing that we don't take into um, account nearly often enough, which is different members of our audience have different colour perception spaces. Any given audience, about 10% of them are going to have a colour perception that's different from 90% of that audience. 
So vizcheck.com, I find a really nice one for uploading your plot and seeing um, if someone has red-green colour blindness or one of the other um, types of colour modified vision, how your plot would appear to that audience and how you can tune your colour palette to make sure that your science is being well conveyed to your whole audience. Now, these nice little plots here are the kinds of things that are really nice and easy just to glance down and say, okay, is this one good for a wide audience? Is this one good for printing in black and white? And palatable, um, which is, there's a nice web page here um, on the github.io um, slash palatable site, which allows you to look at all of these. And the thing I like about palatable is it incorporates the whole color brewer um, set of palettes, but it also has them formatted in a way that you can just load them straight into matplotlib. So you can have your color brewer uh, qualitative palette set, say, and maybe you want the dark number two, and this has seven units to it. So, you know, you can just go through and pick that kind of thing for um, exactly what your data selection is. Now, there's one, you know, so there's a dark two seven, there's a dark two five, you get the idea. <coughs> This is, um, I, th I think that's actually the nicest tool that I have in just in terms of picking palettes and being able to assign them into Matplotlib. And you can use this, of course, if Matplotlib isn't your um, base go-to. The thing about um, colour palettes that I also want to emphasise is you want to work with the colour response of the human eye. And I touched on this a little bit in the sense of there's hue, there's, um, there's the saturation of the colour, the intensity of it. You have how bright a colour is, how light or dark it appears to you, the luminance of it. The colour response of eyes is not a linear thing. You want, you want to work with it. And this little research article here um, posted on IBM actually goes through this um, with these particular plots in a really nice way for outlining some of this. It's a good place to start. This is the same data set, but given two different colour maps. So the one here, you have a... Um, rainbow colour map. The one here you have a colour map where the transition um, across the continuous variable, which in this case is topography, you can see uh, the bathymetric shape around Florida here. This kind of uh, um, transition in the colour map, putting that, uh, um, using a colour map that has a transition in it with a continuous variable so that you can see what's going on a little more, allows you to pull out things about this that are often of um, particular interest to the audience. In this case, <coughs> sea level. This is, when you're dealing with topography, sea level is an important kind of variable you should take into account. So the problem with this map, you can't distinguish that at all. And because the, um, the perception of where the colours is is not uniformly distributed across the gradient, you can kind of go, there's a blob up there, there's some detail in here, there's a, there's a nice transition here, but all of the detail that you get on this side, which tells you what's going on on the landmass versus it gets very deep in the sea, is just entirely lost. And that's purely through what colour map you're using. So work with the response of the, of the eye. Different colours are going to appear lighter or darker to your eye. And this is, a, this is really fun. This is, you know, this is how our detectors and our minds behind them are working to perceive the world. And we're perceiving different colours depending on how our cones interact, <laughs> such that it's quite different from you know, the intrinsic how do our um, senses see the world. Well, our eyes and our minds are sensing the world just the same. So we have to take that into account when we're trying to put together a plot that lets us analyse what the data is showing us. Now, Matplotlib is the primary place everyone tends to start to work with. It's the beautiful big elephant in the room. It's, it's where you go to to build your plots for the most part. And Matplotlib has a whole lot of detail about its colour map choices as well. But in a more general sense, Matplotlib has defaults and it's trying to give you something that is all things to all people. So don't be afraid to play with the defaults. Just because they're set that way, you should experiment. You should play with your matplotlib um, settings and see if you can get a plot that's better for what you need. And matplotlib itself, the defaults have been changed over time. 
So initially there was a colour map which had this non-uniform perception uh, for continuous variables. And uh, Astrofog did a nice example of an astronomical one here. They've changed uh, in Matplotlib 2.0 the default colour map for continuous stuff to a name called uh, Viridus, which takes advantage of the fact the human colour response is better suited to pulling out more detail in hue between uh, the kind of yellow, green, and blue ends of the spectrum. So take advantage of that, have more continuous colour map that better maps to the data, and you can pull out more detail about what's going on and see the artefacts in your data. I'm going to change a little bit here and just spend a few minutes on what's known as chart junk. And Tuft um, coined this as routinely added graphical paraphernalia. This is kind of what I want to get into with defaults in your, in your um, Python plotting packages. It's detail that impedes understanding. Now, you can have your perfectly nice, um, okay, here's some sign curves. Here's some colors assigned to them. I would say I don't. I wouldn't choose these colors because the first thing I look at them and see is there's one of these that's red and one of them that's green. And that would immediately make, okay, some of my audience can't perceive the difference between those two lines if it becomes important to figure out, you know, for the overall understanding of what's going on here. That's something that's nice and easy to fix. Just pick a different color map. But the other thing I'd say is, what are you trying to get across? Okay, there's a function that's smoothly varying in a space, and you're looking at a bounded region of it. Well, there's a grid here. There's an implicit grid in the background of this data. And it's being conveyed here by small, hard to read numbers <laughs> that go across with tick marks and with an outside bounding box that implies that this is a window in the world. But that heavy line is not necessarily really useful to trying to just get across that there is a smoothly varying function going on here. So you can instead to, um, push the grid into the background, cut off the, uh, get rid of the text altogether, and get rid of that heavy bounding line, and make it all of these features about what you're trying to say about the space you're describing implicit in the background of the grid. And this is, um, so this is off the Seaborn package, which I have some other links to later. The grid has become background, and the grid is built into the background as well. And the tick marks have vanished altogether. Less pixel, fewer pixels assigned to trying to convey stuff that's not integral to the message you're trying to get across. Now, I think as... Uh, um, coders and as scientists, we have a tendency to um, try and make things look... There's a concept in coding where of kind of effortless things, <coughs> where you're trying to say your end product is perfect, it was arrived at without effort, and it stands alone by itself as a kind of <laughs> brilliant monument to the fact that this was made with yeah, not really much work. No, no, it, it just, it was done but I think it's more useful to talk through how we actually get to this point. So I'm going to show you some plots that I don't think that I wouldn't publish and that aren't perfect. <laughs> so this is one that's uh, um, trying to show you some orbital parameter space. So this is um, the shape of an orbit. So semi-major axis going out across this way, um, eccentricity of distortion of the orbit up this way, and tilt or inclination of the orbit relative to the plane of the solar system up this way. And I have some points on here. These are things we've discovered. Fun. How are they clustering in orbital parameter space is what I'm trying to get across. Is there structure and dependency here? Well, okay. There's no... I can assign a... Um, I can assign a colour palette to them because I know that they have um, some property which is, um, which is not related um, intrinsically to each other. I can assign a colour palette where the colours are not um, related, and I can see that there's some structure here, some structure here. These ones aren't related to what's going on down here. I can make that transparent. But overall, this plot is its a very big picture look. So if I go in, on the other hand, you know, now there's a lot more stuff going on. <laughs> the trans-Neptunian region ends up with a lot more detail, and 
One of the things I'm pulling out here is I'm introducing a new parameter in order to try and display the structure, and that's transparency. Transparency is your friend when you're trying to deal with these kinds of clustering dense data sets. And um, matplotlib allows you to set the alpha of your points. Use this. <laughs> it's really nice and friendly. But this is still something I wouldn't consider you know, really useful for figuring out what's going on, partly because the points are too big. So, OK, let's shrink the size of the points, keep the error bars, add some other data where I don't have error bars for it, see if I can figure out say what's going on in this big clustered um, set down in here, or whether there's a wiggle in here, what's going on there. That sort of tells me there's, some, there's a lot of things going on here, and, um, and there's a lot of science you can pull out of this. But in some ways, it doesn't tell me anything about, because I've lost that color mapping that I had initially, it doesn't tell me what's going on with the orbital classes anymore. So if we put that information back in, drop the error bars because they're not telling me a whole lot in this case, you can end up seeing that this population, this population, you have another little resonant orbital pass through here, but these ones form a separate grouping. And this is almost at the point where I'd go, okay, this is, um, this is a plot you could start to use for things. I've, you know, there's, there's no um, axis on the sides here, I've made the grid um, intrinsic to the background, but I could still minimize the amount of chart junk on this side. I could pull some of the numbers out here and figure out a way to minimize the amount of visual clutter from just trying to get across the fact that there's different populations here and they have internal structure. So I said I'd tell you a little bit about some plots as well. Palatable I mentioned before, Seaborn, um, I've shown you one or two from is a nice package, if you're very familiar with things like matplotlib, it's a nice one for working in a pleasant way with some of the things that are default in matplotlib, but you might want to experiment with um, a situation where the defaults don't involve a lot less chart junk. And pretty plotlib was kind of the one that um, started by introducing a lot of the absence of outside black lines and that kind of thing. And Seaborn has kind of taken that over. So if you were using pretty plot lib, it's, it's not being developed quite so much anymore, and Seaborn offers some of that approach. The other thing you want to consider is what is the end purpose of your plot? Are you going to be making it for putting a, um, in presentations? Are you making it for publication? Are you making it for putting on the web? How interactive do you want it to be? And uh, um, d3.js has kind of taken over for this approach. It allows you to make data really interactive. And there's, there's something, you know, a PDF is still inherently very limited in this way. And Bokeh and Plotly have uh, um, really taken off in the last few years for this. Um, Matplotlib D3 was, uh, with our own Jake Vanderplas, was uh, um, looking at taking this from a just your finished matplotlib figure and pushing it across straight to the um, to D3 so that you could have it straight on the web and interact with it that way. And um, these have gone really mature in the last little while. Plotly in particular, um, I would say is probably, now, now Plotly has gone open source. Um, I would say that Plotly was always open source. Plotly is, I think, probably one of the major places to start. If I was going to just, if I didn't have a whole bunch of that plot lib um, basic plots that I've built over the years, I'd probably end up starting in either plot or bokeh. Uh, the one problem with bokeh at the moment is it still can't save to PDF. So some of these things, it's nice, okay, if you can build something and tweak it for, all right, here's my web version, here's my presentation version, here's my publication version, it's nice to be able to have the different saving options in a uh, vector graphics format. So I'll just finish up with this um, quote, which I particularly like, which is that the greatest value of a plot is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. And that's the end reason of why we're going to all this effort with assigning color maps, with minimizing the visual intrusiveness of what's in our plots. We're trying to convey a message to our audience about what the science wants to show us. And hopefully what the science will show us is what we never expected to see. Thank you.
the presentation and hand out at the same time, mm -hmm. do you find that you need to use different color maps for between the presentation and the hand? Potentially. Um, it's going to depend if you have a color printer available. Uh, you're also going to format the plots differently. So there, there are a number of approaches um, to how you can do this, but ideally you have one core plotting code and then you have a bunch of switches that you can toggle to say, this is the ones that I'm generating for the presentation, this is the ones I'm generating for the handout. And you just you build your um, code accordingly. Mm. All right, let's thank Michelle again.